Hey everyone, and welcome to the Drama Club. On this week's episode, we talk about our cousin Erica Jane and part 273 of the Kardashian Cultural Appropriation Saga. And then, Steph tells the story of the first supermodel, Gia Karangi, and I tell the story of forever art girl, Paula Abdul. Stay tuned. What up, fam? What up, fam? Feels good, right? Woo, right? <laughs> Yeah, I know it do. Yeah. And without further ado, without further ado uh, uh, we broadcast some live from C8. Oh no, me. Is it water? Is it water? No, it's a beer. Oh, it's a beer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, bitch. You be drinking funky water. <laughs> All right. Luca, you don't drink beer. <laughs> yeah, he do. Yeah, I do. Mom. <laughs> actually <laughs> i do oh, okay anyways. so something happened to me at like 4 a.m this morning that i i had to like physically restrain myself from like texting you because i was like i'm not gonna wake this bitch up for this shit but as as you guys know um i've been binging the real housewives of beverly hills oh, right and i've i've finished it i finished it it's taken me what four months or something but i think i know what you're gonna tell me about now i've, I've finished and Erica was talking <laughs> on She's an episode Salvadorian. yesterday. She's Salvadorian. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that fucking amazing? That's crazy. I know. Oh, my God. You guys are everywhere. I'm like, I damn. I hope I, I hope uh, I should check my DNA matches to see if she's my cousin, too. <laughs> <laughs> if she's my cousin, I'm going to ask to borrow money. <laughs> what up erica jane hey i don't want the money i just want the outfits the fits are just like off let me the borrow chain. some clothes yeah let me borrow that jet, let me that borrow car. that that moschino suit that she wears with like the hat <laughs> let me borrow your your house right quick <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me borrow oh. let me borrow that latex dress that she wore in like amsterdam or, Ber- or berlin I'm going to roll up to her house in old Pasadena and just knock on the door like Felicia in, like, <laughs> in like rag, raggedy ass shorts and shit. My hair looking all fucked up. And be like, hey, Erica. No, but you'll be accepted because you're a lawyer. Tom's a lawyer. <laughs> oh, that's true. No, that motherfucker's going to try to put me to work. Fuck that. <laughs> I want this shit for free. I was pumped, uh, though. You should have seen, yeah. like, the smile on my face. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Dude, me and my brother were pumped. He texted me, and we had a whole ass thing about it. Oh, damn. Yeah, that was awesome. Because she's my favorite housewife now that LVP's gone. Me, too. Yeah, she's the best. Yeah, definitely, since LVP's gone. R.I.P. LVP. <laughs> <laughs> I read that Kyle is trying to have her own Vanderpump rule style show at the agency. What? I was like, fish ain't nobody trying to see that. <laughs> no, my, one of my favorite tweets is like the worst character on Real Housewives is the agency, agency hat. hats. <laughs> <laughs> Make that money though. That's free advertising. Yeah, I'll watch a thirty-minute video of Mauricio just like walking around just in a suit. <laughs> in his suit, yeah, <laughs> walking around showing a like, house. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll watch that shit. This is the bathtub. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you damn right that's the best <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> one of my favorite things on real housewives now with lisa lisa rinna is how everybody's so thirsty for, for um, harry hammond <laughs> yeah it's so awesome because he like is so unfazed by it right yeah yeah it's like he doesn't give a fuck it's because when was he sexiest man alive? Like in the 80s or something? Yeah, like, he's kind of past his prime. He's over it. He's fine, though. Like I, He's still real fine. I love him on Mad Men, like with the glasses and like the salt and pepper hair. I'm, I'm with it. Me too. Lisa's really bomb, too. They're a bomb-ass oh, yeah. couple. Um, Shout out to Serena Williams for making it on the Wheaties box. Ooh, girl. That <laughs> shit. <laughs> How has it taken? Those are little things like that that you don't notice, you know, that tell you where yeah. we are <laughs> but low-key also who the fuck eats wheaties <laughs> never tasted a weedy in my That's damn life be the worst cereal of all time low-key i would rather be on the box of like captain crunch with the captain oh yeah 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 yeah. you know he's what i cool. mean like he's some, cool some cereal that people actually fucking not eat the lucky charms though because i don't fuck with leprechauns yeah i don't really like lucky charms too much i, I fuck with the pebbles 
family fruity the pebbles. pebbles. The chocolate ones. Cocoa pebbles. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like those. What's, what's your favorite cereal that's like bad, like a like a kid cereal? Oh, um, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, I think. I used to like, that one's good, but I used to really, really like French Toast Crunch. Do you remember They don't make those anymore, huh? No, they don't make that. That shit's bomb. They also used to have Cinnamon Pebbles. It was called Cinnamon Pebbles. And they don't have that anymore, and that shit was a fucking bop, (laughs) man. I also like the one that was like, um, oh, the Corn corn Pops? Is is that a Those are good. Have you ever had those ones with the fucking rooster on it? What's it called? Kellogg's? Uh, cornflakes. Cornflakes. Yeah. Have you ever had those and your grandma throws sugar in it? Yes. That's like I grew up on that shit. That's why I'm five Me foot too, ten. Me too, man. <laughs> no fuck you. I'm not five foot ten. And I eat that shit. Oh my god. That's what god. It, my breakfast used to be leche, Please? leche with like uh with coffee with instant coffee and sugar. Yeah, like a tiny bit of coffee. No, like a like a big ass spoonful of coffee. Really? I used sugar. to always have coffee too, but like a tiny bit when I was little. And uh and cornflakes with sugar on it. Instead of like why? Is it cheaper than frosted flakes? I have no idea. No, I just think it's a it's a fucking it's it's cultural. Yeah, it's cultural. <laughs> that's a, that's my culture <laughs> my culture is not a costume <laughs> how dare you fucking rooster you know the history of that cereal right it's what? like the the guy kellogg the guy who invented it made it he wanted he decided that people were masturbating because there was too much flavor in their food so he <laughs> wanted so he created a breakfast cereal that was so bland to keep little boys from masturbating Oh my god. What's wrong with this person? I don't know. But I don't really like now that I'm an adult, I haven't had one of those cereals in a long time, like those like sugary ones. Uh-huh. But I've always actually low key fucked with the adult cereals. Like I like the the one with the raisin brand. That's, oh, really? That shit yeah, is good. It's okay. I like uh, I've got honey bunches of oats. I like, that shit. That's is so good. That's my go to nowadays. Yeah. If and when I eat cereal, but yeah, that shit's a bop. Yeah. I also like brand muffins, though. So I just think I'm like a brand person. That shit is good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 80 years old. Yeah. 80, 30 going on 80. <laughs> um, did you see the Charlie's Angels trailer? I did see it. Okay. What are you? Okay. So I people know that we love the Drew ones, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. they're so fun. And that's yeah. like Flower Films' first, first thing I think that they did. Oh, really? I wouldn't be I, surprised. I'm pretty sure. And like, j- it's just fucking amazing that it's Drew Barrymore, Cameron Diaz, mm-hmm. and Lucy Liu, right? Yeah. Like, they're so badass. What together. a killer combo. I know. And now. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. And no one's saying that those movies are like good, good. movies. They're just yeah. fun. They're mm-hmm. like the the colors like and like the tongue action. Tongue in cheek. And, yes, yep. Yeah. Good music. Yeah. Right. So that's my my... My standard isn't necessarily like I want this to be an amazing movie. I just want it to be fun and exactly. You know. But I saw the trailer and first of all, it can't be Kristen Stewart and two unknown bitches. I don't like exactly. that. Exactly. It could be Kristen Stewart and two bad bitches. Yes, yes. It's but it can't be Kristen Stewart and who are the other people? Exactly. Because yeah. half the fun of it is look at this team up of bad bitches, you know? I know. Yeah. And then What's her face is Bosley. I'm fine with that. Elizabeth but, Banks. Yeah. And yeah, I, and I like her. I do too. But she's also like producing it. She's she directed it. Pro- and, or directing and she it. She directed it and she wrote the screenplay. Why would she do this to the cast? I'm most upset about the cast of yeah. Charlie's Angels. I mean, it's the most important part. Because why? how do we go from Cameron Diaz, Drew Barrymore, right. and Lucy Liu to Kristen Stewart and... I don't know. And, and I don't know. the rest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, okay, the, the soundtrack, because remember the first time it's, iconically, it's a Destiny's Child. Right. And this time it's a team up of, of Miley Cyrus, Ari- Ariana Grande, and Lana Del Rey, which low-key would be a better Charlie's Angels. <laughs> I know. No. At first, May, at first when I saw that coming up, I was like, oh, my God, are they Charlie's Angels? And yeah. And I was kind of like, oh, wow. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. That I understand. I'm like, all right, okay. Whatever. Miley Cyrus, yeah. She would have been better there with, with Kristen Stewart. Yeah. She's an actress. She'd yeah. be acting. Yeah, she'd be acting and shit. <laughs> <laughs> she got hair. <laughs> I get it. I get it. 
I don't mind. Mm. You know, I feel Kristen Stewart is a little wooden to me. I don't know that I've ever seen her in anything and been like, she's great. I don't think she has range in her face. Like she has one fucking facial expression and it's kind of like blank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Which is the same uh, thing that people say about like Keanu Reeves. Like Mm. he doesn't have range in his face. Yeah. He's just kind of like. But I but I don't mind the casting of her. It's the it's the casting Neither. of the other two that bother yeah. me. Because I kind of believe uh, Kristen as like you yeah. know fighting scenes and shit like that. Because she yep. seems tougher like for yeah, a girl, yeah, yeah. you know. So I actually don't mind her. But yeah, could we pull like fucking Rihanna and Miley Cyrus or like literally just yeah. any other two people? Ugh. And also just the the beats on the trailer, they don't seem like it's not doesn't seem like it's hitting. It doesn't seem funny. No, it's, nothing seems so great, right? Yeah. The I mean the action the the one scene they show of Christian Stewart fighting that looks good. Yeah, but I'm I'm oh, not man. I'm not excited. I'm worried. I know. <laughs> I'm so worried. It's a wash, honestly. Like I'm I'm already like convinced that I'm it's gonna be whatever. Me too. I'll go back and rewatch the ones with <laughs> Drew and Lucy. <laughs> Ooh, Barracuda. So the other thing that happened this week is uh, Kim Kardashian. Kardashian did it again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, you Kardashian. (laughs) Kim Kardashian. Uh, She she did what the Kardashians do. Yeah, they be making shit to sell. (laughs) To sell. (laughs) And okay, so then this week she debuted two new products, right? Right. One, the first being the the kimono. Right. (laughs) Which I don't know. Is it like we know that she trademarked the word kimono. But do we know that it's for the Spanx? Like it's because I just thought people were speculating that it's for the Spanx. Yeah, it is for this particular product. It is for the Spanx. Okay. And Spanx is not the appropriate word. It's like, what's it called? Shapewear. Shapewear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So she, she created a line of shapewear that she called the kimono or just kimono yeah. which right right quickly started trending on twitter as kim oh no yes <laughs> uh which they already have a problem with uh cultural appropriation right because they uh, do that to black people like non-stop N- non-stop right <laughs> yeah and now she just and it's so like it's just so ignorant. Like, it's just right. so bad because it's obviously she's doing it because her name is fucking in it. But I, like, I get bitch, I get that you want to play on words. That's fine. But but this? bitch, like, what planet do you live on where you're like, yeah, that has my name in it. I can yeah. use that <laughs> <laughs> swoop just like she does everything else. I'll take that. Oh, my God. It's so fucking awful. So Ugh, it's bad. So people were calling her out. And of course, and First of all, I want to say that since I've been a little girl, the kimono has been like the most beautiful garment to me. It's it is. like to me, that's the ultimate. I wish I could put one on. Like I wish I could feel what it feels like to wear a kimono and like and like bringing it back to Erica Jane. Do you remember when they went to oh, Japan yeah. and she wore like a vintage kimono? Yes, it was exactly. like the most beautiful thing in the world. And so it, they're pieces of fucking art. They they're are. not shapewear. <laughs> Are you and, fucking kidding me? And the fact that she's just like, when she knows that she's going to get dragged for it. I know, but they just don't care because they get away with it. Yeah. Because people stand them so hard, yeah. no matter how fucking pointless they are. Ugh. I also did not like in the press release for the product where she said that she created. Okay, so she has a point. She created shapewear because there are certain garments that she wears that requires different shapes that aren't readily available like you you usually have to take scissors to them to make and as somebody who wears shapewear i agree yeah okay that does happen so good job girl okay you found a need all right let's do this right Uh and then uh the other thing that she put was also i have trouble finding shapewear that matches my skin tone Uh uh-huh bitch your skin tone is white that's that's the the literal color of all shapewear like you can walk Mm -hmm. in just like close your eyes and pick one it's the color Mm -hmm. of your skin so yes (sighs) Yeah, it's very, very silly. And speaking of the color of her skin. Oh, my (laughs) God. Earlier in the week, as if shit wasn't bad enough, (laughs) she started off the week by introducing a line of body makeup. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Basically, it's like foundation for your legs and arms and shit. It's nothing new, but people dragged her for it, though. Yeah, they were like really or that. What's that one girl that drags everybody? Jamil. Oh, yeah. Jamila Jamil. She did a whole ass thing like, damn, when is it going to be enough? Like you want kids to put fucking makeup on their whole ass body? (laughs) I 
I don't mind this because I I wear body makeup sometimes. Like I I have the spray for your legs, you know, like the instead of wearing um like nylons, it's like liquid, right. like liquid nylons. This and this isn't obviously this isn't a thing that's like for everyday use. This is like you're on a red carpet or you're going to the prom or like whatever. Right. I get it because I use that stuff too. I know what you're talking about that Sally Hansen one. Yeah. That's the one I use too. Yeah. The spray thing. Mm-hmm. I get it. No, I know what you're saying because it's not something you do every day. But for whatever reason, it still rings bad to me, her promoting this because she fucking knows what she's doing. Well, that's what I was going to say. My problem with it is that it's like, um, you know, she's just going to drop it and be irresponsible about it. Like, yeah, and not try to sell it like, oh, look how fun you do this when you're on vacation and you're like, you know, whatever. No, you're taking Instagram like, pictures on the it. beach. Every day, you, like, wear this fucking glitter shit on your fucking knee so it yeah. doesn't look wrinkly. Because knees can't be wrinkly now, <laughs> kids. Everything is facetune. <laughs> facetune your fucking veins and shit. Facetune your nipples. Facetune it all. But I uh, I saw somebody posted already, like, a picture of... It was, like, somebody's mom. She was like, oh, thanks, Kim, for making this product because her mom had those, like, really bad... Um, veins? Yeah, Red like... Veins? Yeah, and like thrombosis or something and she mm-hmm. used the she used the makeup to cover it and she was like for the first time in the year she can wear a dress or shorts or something like yeah. that yeah i love that that's great yeah that's absolutely great but, but that's not what she's promoting right you really yeah. need to be responsible with stuff like this especially when you're that family because yeah because so many you reach, young fans yeah their fans gotta be like what 13 to fucking 24 mm-hmm. or some shit yeah, yeah. oh and you're dumb when you're that old too. That's the problem. Too. Oh yeah, just you like eat totally, that shit up. Yeah. Yes. There, are, there are problems when you're that old that you didn't even realize you had until somebody told you. You know. I know. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> like perfectly happy with your fucking fucked up legs, <laughs> <laughs> and then someone, and then fucking Kim Kardashian's like, "Hey, throw this fucking glitter cake up <laughs> on your on your knee." <laughs> Yeah, so they uh, they did it again. <laughs> They're at it again. <laughs> They're at it again, Jimmy. <laughs> and now, the basic step. It's easy to follow. It goes like this. Girl left, white one. Boy right, black one. Girl white, black two. A boy black, white girl. Boy brown, brown. Duck, duck, oh, well, you see how it goes. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie. And my name is May, and together we are the Drama Club. Thank you for listening. The club is now in session. Yes. Oh, we need to remember to do that every single episode. I like how that shit goes. Yeah. Um. This is the podcast all about celebrity scandals, gossip, hot topics, um, biographies, <laughs> ethnicities, ethnicities, <cultural laughs> appropriation, uh, body makeup, Sally Hansen's uh, cereal. <laughs> <laughs> we we low-key did talk about cereal for a second. <laughs> May and uh, I discovered a podcast that is very similar to ours, and we have decided we're better than them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, I think, like, the world has decided that we're better than them. <laughs> Thank you, May. Thank you. I accept. <laughs> uh, we won't say who they are, though. Obviously. Don't at me. Don't at me. (laughs) (laughs) I love the other day when Winnie Cummings was all confused about how to word how to use the word bitch. She was like, What is the word bitch? Da 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 all this shit. I was like, bitch, shut up. What on Twitter? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. I like her. She's funny. Oh, she is funny. Her show was complete shit though. Which one? Whitney? I think it was called Whitney, yeah. I thought you were talking about two broke girls for a minute. Oh no, that was her show too? Mm Mm-hmm. Wow, I didn't know she wrote that. She also did, remember, Chelsea Handler had a short-lived show that was based on her life with right. Homegirl from Orange is the New Black in that 70s show. Yeah. Yeah, that was also, Whitney was like doing everything for like five minutes. Yeah, she's working hard. I respect that she did the Roseanne reboot. Oh, before I forget, I saw a trailer for a movie with Helen Mirren, Ian McKellen, and Mr. Carson from Downton Abbey what that shit looks like it's a bop and it's like what is it like helen mirren is like an older late like a you know 80 something lady out here uh-huh. like looking to steal your mans being uh-huh. fine as per you she's looking uh-huh. online to find a fine ass man she finds ian mckellen who <gasps> looks like he's gonna scam her because she's rich as fuck and what? mr carson is like his her homie. butler 
Oh, damn. <laughs> that shit looks good. <laughs> yeah, I need to watch that immediately. Ian McKellen seems cool as fuck, and people like he always does. have good stories about him. Yeah. Like how he's just like a super nice guy and shit, huh? Yeah. Him and the other homie, what's his name from uh Star Trek? Yeah, yeah. Yep. All right, so. we we all know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Patrick Stewart. <laughs> yes, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> that fool seems cool as fuck too. I always see pictures of him and his fucking uh, He had a cats. young ass wife, huh? Yeah, he do got a young ass wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking okay. of young ass wife, um, and the real housewives, fucking Catherine McPhee married a... Uh, Ooh, David Foster? Yeah, today. 34-year mm. age cap. I'm like, damn, okay. girl. Damn. Get, 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 get that, that paper. paper. <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> he's not... He's a good-looking guy. He is. But he doesn't look very good anymore. Oh, really? I haven't seen him in a minute. Yeah, like... You know how we were just talking about um, Harry Hamlin? Yeah. Like, Harry Hamlin still looks yeah, good. Yeah, he held up. <laughs> yeah. David uh, Foster don't look that great. Mm. And he seems like a night. Like, he seems like, at least when he's in it, he seems like a devoted husband. But, I mean. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. But also, Harry Hamlin's an actor. So, he's got to, like, keep up that kind of shit, too. Yeah, right? that's true, though. All right. I'm doing the story of Gia Karanji. Yes. Karanji. Uh, for this, I watched the HBO movie Gia, starring Angelina Jolie. Yes, in one of her breakout roles. I think she was still in something before this, right? I don't think so. Maybe as a kid, like a straight up child actor. Okay, and it's worth it to just see like baby Mila Kunis too play young Gia. Cause oh that's, yeah, I forgot that's about fucking that. awesome. Yeah, and young Angelina Jolie too before she because she's so fucking good, but. It's like, this is her at the beginning. So you just yeah. know, like, oh, my God. And, like, right. now she's such a master. It's like. And she's got. I like the way she looks in that movie because she's she looks like a little baby. Like, she's got, like, she's baby fat on her on her cheeks and stuff. She's so cute. Yeah, she looks good. I also read some Days Digital articles, Vogue articles, and consulted the almighty like, Wikipedia. Yes. Okay. So Gia was a supermodel. Just plain and simple. Mm -hmm. She was born on January 29th, 1960. Same year as JFK Jr. Wow. She was the third and youngest of her family. Children. Sorry, I said that weird. Her family children. Okay. <laughs> her family children. <laughs> she, had, she wasn't just the youngest, period. <laughs> she had two older brothers and her parents had what she described as a very unstable, violent marriage. Oh, no. They would fight a lot and I think it would become physical even. Uh-oh. I also read one article in the independent that said that Gia was sexually abused by a man when she was a child mm -hmm. but i didn't see that anywhere else and they don't show that in the movie mm -hmm. so i don't really know about okay. that you know just mm -hmm. but it's out there that that happened okay um is she italian she is like part italian and part all sorts of other stuff she was born in philly but oh that's what's up yeah let me tell you exactly. Yeah, so her mom's Irish and Welsh, her dad's Italian. So anyways, her childhood definitely wasn't easy. Her mom ended up leaving the family with another man when Gia was 11 years old. And her two older brothers went to go live with her mom and she stayed back and grew up with her dad. Huh, that's such a weird dynamic that happens yeah. there. Because if yeah. anything, you would think maybe the other way around. Yeah, and Gia really loved her mom and was super attached to her mom. So I don't really understand why Gia wow. was left behind. Maybe it's like, um, you know, maybe her mom had to work a lot. So then it's harder with a younger kid. Like, you right, know, you that happens. The, you got the, the older ones that kind of take care of themselves a little bit. You never know. For sure. Gia then around this time was known as being like really spoiled and kind of manipulative to get what she wanted. Mm hmm. She was constantly searching for people's attention. She was super codependent on whoever would attach to her, friends, family, literally anybody. She ended up becoming kind of popular as a teenager and while she was in high school. She and her friends became obsessed with David Bowie and became obsessed with his high glam style. Do Bowie stands have a name? I don't know. Bowieans? <laughs> <laughs> She also really loved Bowie for being an outspoken bisexual since Gia was really in touch with her sexuality from a young age and she was openly in relationships with women and men. Dope. 
However, she didn't want to accept the, quote, typical lesbian style. These are her words. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to be labeled as anything. So she really liked Bowie because she liked to kind of dress androgynously and she wore a lot of menswear. Yeah. This is in the 70s? Yeah. Okay. So she was super into macking and getting down, and she always had a boo around. Hey. People said she was always flirting with everybody and always coming on to basically whoever the fuck was around her. Mm-hmm. Oh, because she's codependent. She likes right. that attention. Yep. Yes. So needless to say, she was super, super fucking beautiful. Mm-hmm. She was known in her small town as being super, super beautiful and was discovered by a local photographer one night when she was just out dancing. <laughs> He asked to take some pictures of her and he sent them into some advertising agencies. And through that, she starred in some local newspaper ads. Oh, cool. Then she moved to New York at 17 years old. She left her fucking family. She by herself moved to New York and had a meeting and immediately signed with Wilhelmina Models. Wow. Which is like the big, it's basically, it's Wilhelmina and Ford Models. Like those are the two biggest fucking agencies. Wilhelmina Cooper herself took a super liking to Gia and took her under her wing, personally mentoring her. Wow. That's fucking crazy, right? So Gia had like, Gia was very charming. Like we know that. So I think. uh, I don't know if Gia was charming. (laughs) Like in in a psychopath sort of way. (laughs) Yeah. Like I just think they were so ready for something different in the fashion world that everybody loved her. Okay. She was and I literally wrote this at this time, like she was different from everything that was around at the time. And Wilhelmina said, suddenly this no filtered, no makeup, menswear loving brunette walked into rooms that were filled with mostly blonde, blue eyed beauties. Mm -hmm. So everybody would fucking look at her like she stood out. Yeah. Wilhelmina got Gia tons of interviews and test shoots and cleaned her up a little bit because <laughs> when Gia was younger, she was like dyeing her hair crazy colors and shit. And yeah. Gia was like, bitch, dye your hair black. Let it go out. <laughs> so she was like rough around the edges. Right. Wash the lightning bolt off her face. <laughs> so then Gia's first major shoot was in 1978 with top fashion photographer Chris von Weinhimmen. They had a photo shoot and afterwards he asked the models to stay behind to pose nude for him and none of them did except for Gia. So he had her pose nude behind a chain link fence with makeup artist Sandy Linter who Gia became obsessed with. Uh, Personally or? Personally. Okay. This part of the movie is awesome too because you see full blown naked Angelina Jolie. Oh my She's just like standing there (laughs) fucking naked all crazy. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. So Gia and Sandy briefly dated, but they never had a stable relationship Mm -hmm. because when they met, Sandy was in a relationship and after that, they just never really got it together to settle down together. Sandy was like committed to her man Mm -hmm. and Gia was over the top obsessive. So that caused problems. Oh, yeah. So it just never really came to be. Mm hmm. And Gia was super, super needy, so she obviously hated the rejection, and she felt like she was all alone in New York because she was, basically. Her family was back in Philly. Her mom barely fucking cared about her, and she couldn't get into a real relationship, so she she felt super alone. And she's a little tiny baby. She's, what, 18, 17 years old, Yeah. yeah. They really started cracking down on that and modeling. It used to be, like, when I was a kid, it used to be, like, Oh, just send them somewhere. You know, you would just like send your, oh, we would like you to model somewhere, like send them to Paris or whatever. It's now it's cool. like, you know, you Come go. With your mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so after one year of living in New York, Gia was basically a well established model. Wow. Oh. That chain link photo shoot was a breakout moment for her. And it didn't hurt that she had the, all the love and support of Wilhelmina by mm-hmm. her side. So she quickly rose to the top of the fashion world. Gia even said, quote, I started working with good people very fast. I didn't build into a model. I just sort of became one. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. So she was doing both print and runway at this time, and she was everywhere. She starred in Blondie's music video for the song Atomic. (laughs) I know. She was a favorite subject for some of the best fashion photographers, which in a world of photographs is obviously really fucking important. Yeah. Yeah. She was featured on the cover of Vogue UK, Vogue Paris, American Vogue. All of the Vogues. All of Vogues, Cosmopolitan. And from 1979 to 1981, shot campaigns for some of the biggest fashion houses in the world, including Armani, Christian Dior, 
Versace, Yves Saint Laurent, oh everybody. God. And when you look at pictures of her, like she just fucking has it. Oh, she's she ha- perfect. Like it's she's the type of model who's just exuding personality from the photos. Even if you it's could just get like her still, attitude, right? Yeah, yeah. She's so it's yeah. so good. You, I love when someone is clearly born to do something. You know, mm-hmm, and like this mm-hmm. seems like one of those. Right. Around town, they started just simply calling her Gia, which is I think when you know you really made it. Your first name basis. Yeah. And allegedly, she earned more than a hundred thousand dollars the first year she went to Ooh. New York. Ooh, in nineteen seventy eight. She's 18 years old, May. Holy shit. Yeah. So Gia was beautiful, but different looking. And everybody liked her attitude and how she didn't really care about rules or anything. She'd do basically anything. They'd be like, would you mind posing nude? She'd be like, sure. Would you mind taking off all your makeup for this? Sure. Mm -hmm. Would you mind putting on all this fucking makeup? Sure. Like she didn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. So obviously this becomes a problem later on. (laughs) But in the beginning, it was part of her allure and stuff. Yeah. So, like everybody else who rises to the top at a young age, Gia began partying. Yes, 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 yes. And May knows where the best party was in the late 70s. Studio 54. And early 80s was CBGB. And guess where the fuck Gia was? Studio 54 (laughs) and CBGB. Hell yeah. Oh, she probably met um, Debbie Harry at CBGB. and And that's how she got in the Blondie video. Yeah. Yeah. She was like, Allegedly a fucking regular at the clubs almost every night. Mm-hmm. She was a she was a cokehead. Mm-hmm. She was a drinker and everybody loved her. She was a crowd favorite. Yeah. Then out of nowhere, her mentor and agent, Wilhelmina Cooper, got sick and died <gasps> in March 1980 at 40 years old. Oh my God. What she died? I know. Of? She had lung cancer, but oh it had God. been undiagnosed. And suddenly it was like she got hospitalized and then it was like she's dead wow on some betty draper shit yeah so Gia was fucking crushed yeah oh my god since basically as she had found in wilhelmina what she had lost from her own mom mm, yeah so this combined with the instability of her relationships caused her to really fall into a sort of depression and into the world of drugs really hard yeah and then the other thing is wilhelmina if anything that's the one adult in your life who's like your especially in your business is your business mentor so she's going to be like don't fuck up your bag you know like exactly show yeah. up here at this time do this do this so somebody's there like keeping her in looking check. out for you yeah yeah. yeah so first Gia was like she was a cocaine user she snort cocaine and the trend at the time i guess with upper crusty folks mm-hmm. was that injecting heroin is like really ghetto so she started snorting heroin Mm. and then obviously she just that led into her injecting heroin too oh my god her addiction to heroin then completely took over her life Gia was unable to get in control of it and it leaked into her professional career she was canceling shoots like days beforehand or hours Mm. beforehand she was having violent tantrums on set She had trouble getting along and working with any other models. She would walk out of photo shoots if they took too long. Yeah. She'd be like, I have to go pick up. And she'd fucking leave. And she even started falling asleep in front of the camera several times. This is horrible. It's so bad. I'm surprised Uh, that she did that, though, because like, okay, that's that's your fucking job. You're a model. Like, you can't have tracks, you know, (laughs) like this is bad. Yeah. Francesco Scavulo, who is a leading fashion photographer and was a close friend of Gia's, recalled a time in the Caribbean when in the middle of a shoot, she started crying because she couldn't find her drugs in her bag. So the crew had to like lay her down until she fucking fell asleep. Oh, my God. Yeah. And everyone basically said that working with her started becoming impossible because they'd end up taking way too long to get her to get it together enough to pose fuck and people would have to like sit and give her pep talks like she'd start fucking crying and like throwing a tantrum and they'd have to spend all this time to calm her down that it would fuck up like the whole shoot oh my god somebody help her so it was a disaster and this was like i said when she was at the super tippity top of her career so she was fucking up photo shoots with some of the biggest fashion houses yeah (laughs) ever oh my god just two years after coming on scene Uh uh-huh at this time, she had a shoot for American Folk where she had track marks on her elbows, which required extensive airbrushing. 
But in the original press of the November 1980 issues, reportedly you can still see some of the track marks on her. Wow. In November 1980, after her contract ended with Wilhelmina, Gia signed to Ford Models. But her antics were in full effect, so they dropped her after two weeks. Oh, not even a month. Oh, my God. By now, everybody in the industry basically knows she's a disaster to work with. And her career had flown. Her career that had flown so high was like steep, steep decline. God damn it. And, you know, Mo- she doesn't have any money in the bank. Yeah. You know, it would be yeah. one thing if she was putting money away. But come on. No, now. she ain't. <laughs> So modeling offers stopped rolling in and all of her friends started distancing themselves from her because they feared that their association could harm their own careers. God damn it. Washed up by 20 years old. I know. And the people that would work with her, nobody really fucking cared about the drug use. Like how you're saying Wilhelmina would have cared. Mm -hmm. Nobody fucking cared. They just wanted the perfect shot. So they would just hide her fucking track marks and work on airbrushing. They'd get her enough drugs to get her through the damn photo shoot. Oh, no. Prop her up. (laughs) Right? Like, no one was really looking out for her. And those industry people, they were basically all she had because she was out there alone. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Gia's not getting any work. She's, like, running out of money. And she's like, okay, I have to try and get clean. Mm -hmm. so she moved to philly with her mom and stepdad in february 1981 and she's 21 now okay she underwent a 21 day detox and they put her on methadone she completed the program but just a week later was arrested after she drove her car into a fence in a suburban neighborhood uh because she was on the methadone or she no she Uh. was it was determined that she was under the influence of alcohol and cocaine oh god So she was charged with reckless driving. Uh, After she was released from brief custody, she signed with this agency out in Europe where she worked for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And she it was again like she didn't have any money. So she had to do something. And then at this time, she had to undergo surgery on her hand because she had injected herself in the same place so many times. Oh, God. That there was this open infected tunnel that was leading to one of her veins. Oh, God. Yeah. Isn't that fucking crazy? That's horrible. She needs to go somewhere where she doesn't know anybody. Yeah. Like, she needs to go, like, to a shack in, like, Arizona or something. New Mexico. Right. Right. In late 1981, she was determined again to try to make a fashion comeback, and she signed with Elite Model Management. Mm -hmm. However, she was still doing coke and heroin at this time. Oh, most people at ne- by now are unwilling to work with her, but other people wanted to give her a shot since she had been such a top model just a few years prior. Mm-hmm. And she still had a few friends that really loved her. Um, Francisco Scavulo took pictures of her for the 1982 April cover of Cosmopolitan. But at this point, everybody said they could notice that the drugs was the drugs were taking a toll on her face. Oh. That they could see her eyes were more sunken in. Yeah. And she just looked puffy and stuff. No. And again, they had to cover up her track marks. And this time he had her put her hands behind her back and like poofed out the dress to cover her arms. And by now, the industry also has some rumors going around that Gia was conducting sex work to get drug money and that she might also be HIV positive. No. So all of this leads more and more people to just want to distance themselves from her. Wow. So they they were they wanted to help her get her drugs to like fucking put out pictures like it was a fucking factory, but now they're distancing themselves from her. Right. So by now, Gia's career is basically non-existent. She starts taking photos for department stores and catalogs. Oh. She had one single gig in the high-end world shooting an ad for Versace, but when they called her back to do the next campaign, she left in the middle of the shoot before any shots of her were taken. No. (laughs) Yeah. What? She's self-destructive now because that's somebody giving you a shot, you know? I know, and she just doesn't care. Gia then enrolled in an outpatient program, but she didn't have enough money to pay for it, so she had to claim penniless in order to enter the program on welfare. Mm Mm-hmm. Shortly after completing, she started using again, and her very final photo shoot was for a German mail-order clothing company in Tunisia. However, she was sent home early during the shoot for using heroin while on set. Oh, my God. I know, dude. 
Then in 1983, she left New York for the last time. She had spent most of her money on drugs and she was no longer getting any offers from agencies or any photographers. So she moved around from Philadelphia, where she would crash with her family, to Atlantic City, where she would party and crash with various friends and lovers. Mm -hmm. She entered another intense drug treatment program in December 1984, and after she finished, she briefly got a job at a clothing store. Then she got a job at like a nursing home, but she 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 would quit these regular jobs like she couldn't do it. She had been she was a fucking supermodel. Yeah, she you can't go from the cover of Vogue to be like at a nursing home wiping somebody's ass like <laughs> right like that's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> oh god. So by 1985, she had begun using drugs again, and in order to support her habit this time, she was engaging in sex work in Atlantic City. She came down with pneumonia in December, and she was admitted to the hospital. A few days later, her blood work tested positive for AIDS. Mm -hmm. In the fall, she was hospitalized after being found on the street, badly beaten up with bruises on her body. And then it was determined that she had been raped as well. No. It looked like it had been a drug deal gone bad. This was in Atlantic City? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. She was living. And at that point, she was living on the streets, too. Which in the movie, they show that after she was released for the pneumonia, after she had been diagnosed with AIDS, that her mom wouldn't take her to live at her house because they were scared of the disease. And I never saw that in any other source. But for Mm -hmm. me, it's like kind of makes sense. It sounds true considering everything else her mom has done. Mm -hmm. And then why else would Gia have been homeless around this time, you know? Right. But this was also the early days of the virus. So nurses and doctors would wear like all these full body covers mm-hmm. before entering her room, which knowing Gia probably made her feel so fucking awful. Because yeah, like all trash. She, yeah. Like all she ever wanted was closeness and affection. Mm-hmm. And now she's just like completely. You know, they used to do like um, the people wouldn't want to bring in the meals for the patients. They would just leave them out in the hallways. Uh huh. And then people would just like basically starve until one of their friends would come and feed them because they didn't want to go inside. Yeah. You know who I blame? <laughs> Ronald Reagan. But yeah, that's another story. <sighs> <sighs> then on October 18th, 1985, she was admitted to the hospital and died of AIDS related complications on November 18th, 1986. Gia was 26 years old. Her funeral was held at a small funeral home in Philadelphia and there were no attendees from the fashion world. But later it came out that this was because no one knew she had died. No way. Yeah. Like there was no nobody knew who she was at this point. Like she had made it big so young and it was for such a short period of time. Yeah. Isn't that so sad? Oh, my God. Gia is regarded as one of the first or the first supermodel. Just don't ask Janice Dickinson. Yes, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> Cindy Crawford rose to prominence the year that Gia died. And it w- she was briefly regarded, too, as Baby Gia oh. due to their resemblance. What a great nickname. Right? That's so cute. Cindy admitted to Playboy that a lot of the people she worked with in the beginning were photographers who had loved Gia's look and thought of Cindy as a more professional version of Gia. Wow. Yeah. And that's the story of Gia Karanji. Woo. Damn. Everybody go watch the movie Gia. Oh, yeah. That shit's a where, fucking bop. Where did you watch it? Amazon Prime. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to watch that shit. I was telling you when you said you were going to do this that that's like the first movie I watched when I was like real, real little where I was like, oh, my God, there's naked people <laughs> and there's like drugs. And then I re- she crashes the car in the movie, right? I remember that. Yes. Yeah. That scene. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> that that story makes me really sad, though. It, any story where it's like lost potential like that. Yeah. Where it's like if you just had one person in your life that would have stepped in to help you, you know give you a shoulder to lean on like just someone but fuck yeah i know it's so sad having learned the basic steps you'll now forget them completely i (laughs) i got a story for you steph okay i'm ready for you man (laughs) that's not weird i don't think (laughs) Uh, this one is all about paula Abdul. Oh, yeah. I was like, I know she told me what she's doing. What is it? (laughs) 
I got most of this from a handful of articles on Pop Dust, the Gazette Review, Nikki Swift, and of course, all the Wikipedias. There's surprisingly not that much information out there about Paula, at least like not as much as you would think considering how famous and infamous she is, especially about the juicier stuff, which I guess is, is good for Paula because yeah, she must have like really good like PR team or something mm -hmm. bearing all these stories, but yeah. So our girl Paula was born in San Fernando, California on June 19th, 1962. Happy belated birthday to Paula. She just turned Ooh. 57 years old. So she looks actually pretty great. Yeah, she looks real good. Yeah. Anyway, so Paula is a real life Valley girl. So shout out to the San Fernando Valley, aka the porn capital of the world. <laughs> Throughout Paula's career, especially before the internet, I think Paula's ethnicity was often a big topic of conversation. Oh, do you, that's do you true. remember that? People would always yeah. be like, what is she? Huh, that's interesting. That's so funny. That's so rude. <laughs> She's it's fucking so human. Rude. She's fucking human. What the fuck? Like, no one could quite figure out her background. So I can remember being a kid and always hearing people on TV ask her about it or people speculate about it. Mm -hmm. Everyone was super fascinated by this topic, but it's really not that complicated. Her dad She's American, right? <laughs> yeah, she's American. Her dad was a Syrian Jew and her mom was a Ukrainian Jew. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that, like, in the 80s, 90s, in America, there were only like three ethnicities, and if you didn't fall into one of those, and you had yeah. a last name like Abdul, people were like, "What are you?" <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> anyway, from the time that Paula was a little kid, she was a dancer. Ooh. Rhythm is a dancer. She always talks about seeing Gene Kelly and singing in the rain and being absolutely mesmerized. Oh, that's so cute. That's adorable, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> so Gene Kelly is her dance idol. And to follow in his footsteps, she started taking dance lessons at age eight. Wow. So she took lessons in almost everything, ballet, jazz, tap, and excelled at all the different dance styles and also at academics. So our little Paula was an overachiever. But arguably the most important and consequential extracurricular activity that young Paula did in high school was become a cheerleader. More on that in a minute. Also in her teens, Paula began a battle with bulimia that she would struggle Ooh. with for a long time and that only got worse the more famous she became. Oh, no. Yeah. She would later say, quote, battling bulimia has been like a war on my body. Me and my body have been on two separate sides. I learned at a very early stage I didn't fit in physically. I learned through years of rejections from auditions. I would ask myself, why can't I be tall and skinny like the other dancers? I felt nervous and out of control. She actually goes into a lot of detail about how food numbed those feelings for her and then the shame spiral that followed. Um, it's kind of interesting, but I don't want to get super into it because it actually gives me anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> like, I've, I've never had food issues, but I do reflexively binge eat when I hear about other people's food issues. Like, when I, that's why I had to stop watching my 600 pound life because I would eat everything in the house while that show was fucking on. Like, it was really bad. Uh, yeah, so I have no idea what that pr problem is. But if you're a psychiatrist, call 505-539-0556 and tell me what the fuck is wrong with me. Yeah. Um, at 18, Paula was in a small independent musical called Junior High School. Oh. Which was kind of like a super off, off, off brand fame. And I don't know that anyone ever saw that movie, but it was Paula's first exposure to a real life entertainment job. In 1980, she graduated high school and enrolled at Cal State University, Northridge, where she studied broadcasting. Nice. What up? Shout out CSUN. Didn't um, Ava Longoria just get her degree from there? She got like a master's in like Chicano studies. <laughs> that is so fucking embarrassing if she did. Dude. No actor goes to a Cal State. They all go to Harvard. Don't you just automatically get in if you've been in like any movie that has grossed more than a million dollars? You because you pay for those seminar sources, uh, courses and then all of a sudden you're like, I went to Harvard. Yeah. D uh, Sierra just did that. And Black China just did that, I think, too. I'm sure. Yeah, God. I believe it. Anyway, this made me think that under slightly different circumstances, we could have had Paula on the local news, which I think would have been amazing and perfect. She do <laughs> kind of look like a like, like a, a news, news anchor. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. Anyway, that same year, she put her cheerleading skills to good use when she auditioned for the Laker Girls <laughs> and was chosen for the squad out of a pool of 700 candidates. That's 
awesome. Every time I see like those auditions for cheerleading or shit like that, it looks Ooh. so intense. Yeah, it looks fucking crazy. And they'll like yeah. they'll cut like a million people in the I first know. round, and then like, and when it's you crazy. see them go up there and do the dance, I'm like, they look the same. They, I know. I'm like, <laughs> how do you fucking pick? They all did it the same. What the fuck? Anyway, so the Laker girls had just been formed the previous year when new Lakers owner Jerry Buss decided that the NBA needed to step up the entertainment value of the games and that the Lakers could use a splash of something spicy, something sexy, something fun to go along with their new flashy young team, which would go on to be known as the Showtime Lakers. (laughs) Oh, Jerry Buss. (laughs) (laughs) Cheerleaders weren't really a thing before this in the NBA. So this was something that helped the Lakers stand out and definitely aligned with their new image that really embraced its connection to Hollywood. Nice. So the Laker girls were an immediate hit, quickly became famous in their own right. Like you'll often hear the squad referred to as the world famous Laker girls. That's true. And a lot, if not honestly, all of that has to do with Paul Abdul. Yeah. Because shortly after she joined the squad, actually within three months, she got promoted to head choreographer. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. And well, she's, she's been dancing since she was eight. So. Yeah, exactly. It's, so it's like she's got the dance background and also she did cheer in high school. So she's got like the perfect blend. And the, nobody knew anything about that back then. You know, yeah, back then you awesome. were either a cheerleader or a dancer. Right. At least at this level, like semi-professional level. Right. So she changed the motherfucking game. Like the squad went from, oh, cute, the Lakers have cheerleaders. That's pretty cool. To like, yes, the motherfucking Laker girls. Uh huh. Like you went to the games early to watch them open the show and you'd actually watch the halftime show. Uh huh. They had merchandise like calendars, t-shirts and shit. Uh, they made special appearances and guest spots on TV. It was lit. So Paula was so busy and successful with the squad and the other career opportunities that she was getting as a result of her work with them that she left school at the end of her freshman year. I heard Paula tell a funny story not that long ago where she said that during one of the early rounds of the auditions for the Laker girls, she actually got cut, but she slipped back in without anybody noticing. What? And just like crazy. She was like, do over, you know, (laughs) basically, and just made it to the end. I was like, damn, that's pretty ballsy. That changed your whole life. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a ballsy move. But like at that, I mean, you have nothing to lose. So yeah, what's going to happen? They're just going to kick you out. Who right. Cares? So good for her. As you can imagine, being a Laker girl gives you access to a lot of celebrities. Mm-hmm. Since celebrities starting at around this time started going to Laker games in droves to see and be seen. Right. So it was at a game where Paula was discovered by the Jacksons. Ooh. And in particular, Jackie, who discovered her all night long, if you know what I mean. (laughs) And she and Jackie began a relationship. Okay, okay. The Jacksons then hired her to choreograph the video for their 1984 song, Torture. Mm. The video is famous for being absolutely fucking nuts. Down down to the fact that Michael didn't show up because he was still promoting Thriller. So they replaced him with the wax figure they borrowed from Madame Tussauds. Amazing ridiculous the video shoot was such a disaster that the other jacksons stopped showing up one at a time throughout the shoot and ended up going over schedule and so over budget that it bankrupted the whole ass production company oh my god crazy that's a that was an afternoon delight right there (laughs) however the video i guess did pretty great on mtv and in particular the choreography was praised so paula was hired to choreograph a whole ass tour for the jacksons the victory tour Nice. Doesn't sound like a victory, but okay. <laughs> Which most people actually consider the thriller the thriller tour. one, right? Yeah, because yeah. he didn't do a thriller tour, right? And also, the majority of the set list was thriller and off the wall, and then like some of the Jackson stuff. It was like a handful of Jackson songs. Mm-hmm. So this was a big ass deal, and Paula talks about how terrified she was and how it was a trip at only twenty two years old to tell the motherfucking Jacksons how to oh dance. Oh my god! <laughs> Especially Michael off of Thriller. Yes, exactly. That shit's amazing. They were already legends, and she was a cheerleader. You know, yeah. <laughs> so it must have been fucking nuts, but she did that, and good for her. Through her work with the Jacksons, Paula became Janet Jackson's first choreographer, and she choreographed the iconic videos for. What have you done for me lately? And nasty boys. Oh my God. And when I think of you. That's my, oh baby. Yep. 
and yeah, that shit of is so course, good. control. Oh yeah, that's the one, dude. Janet has. Do you remember? Laps, though. Do you remember? Um, Inception, Third Rock from the Sun. Uh, oh, jo- jo- five hundred days. Levitt. Do you remember when he did control? No. Oh, on the lip sync. Uh, oh, he did show, and he does the choreography. <gasps> it's fucking good, man. Oh my god. Yeah, he does a really good job. He's kind of attractive. No, he's cute. He's like, um, if like Justin Long, but I would fuck him. Yeah, he's just too short, but yeah. he's cute. Yeah, when he's I think of you, yes, like, baby. You know what song she didn't choreograph, which I thought was weird because it's sort of like in this era and also fits the vibe. The what? Um, it's the pleasure principle. Oh. oh. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, that one's a bop. So, um, oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, I'm just thinking about Janet Jackson songs now. Go ahead, you I know. go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, of course, these videos would make Janet a star. Yeah, and go on to define the sound, look, and feel of pop music and music videos in the mid 1980s. It's almost hard to describe how important this was because music videos aren't really a big deal anymore. But at the time, they were huge. Right. And honestly, the inf- the influence of Paula's work with Janet can still be seen in music videos to this day. Of course. And I know we talk about this a lot, but like, I miss music videos. Like, oh, when- me too. <laughs> Once I started watching, I watched all these videos, of course. Then I got into a whole, I started watching the old Madonna videos, oh. and, like Beastie Boys, Sabotage. And like, They're so what good. happened? I don't know. I have no idea. All the Spike Jones music videos are mm-hmm. fucking great. I used to have his DVD. Uh, we, used, we used to watch that shit in college all the yeah, time. Yeah, remember he did the fat lip documentary thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. What happened to Spike Jones? I don't know. That's Where, a good-ass yeah. question. Where are you at, my dude? Mm. Chilling hey, on the Coppola ranch somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I hate that I'm old enough now to be like, in my day, music videos were art. But they were. <laughs> remember <laughs> Kanye's video for Flashing Lights? Ooh, that, yeah. Is that Spike Jones? I don't think so. No. That shit was so good. Yeah. That might be one of the last like great music videos. Artistic videos. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So fun fact. Bloop. Paula choreographed the iconic Tom Hanks giant keyboard piano scene from Big. What? <laughs> yes. This That's is- so random and awesome. Paula is a fucking icon, man. And it hadn't really hit me until I saw it all like in one place when I started. Yeah. You know? That's amazing. She also did the dance sequences in Zamunda from Coming to America. Wow. Where she met and later dated Arsenio Hall. Ooh. Okay. Okay. That's a cool ass couple. That's a great couple. And yeah. like they have a really cool dynamic because she goes on his show. They seem like they remain friends because they're like just real cool and chill. And like, yeah. He seems dope. Like, he I, seems really dope. Why doesn't he still have a show? I don't yeah, know, understand. He needs a show. Okay. Yeah. She did Jerry Maguire, which I don't remember there being dancing in it. Was there like maybe touchdown dancing in it or something? Yeah, like what? She might oh, have there, that. there are cheerleaders though. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that makes sense. She did the cheerleading sequences from Best Picture winner American Beauty. What? Uh huh. And she won an Emmy for her choreography for her own performance at the American Music Awards. That's awesome. And she also has an Emmy for choreographing an episode of the Tracy Ullman show. Wow. I love Tracy Ullman. You know what's funny is um, I'll always remember this one thing when American Idol was huge. It's got to be mm-hmm. like season one because it's it's classic mm-hmm. Paula, Simon, and Randy. Mm-hmm. And Paula and Simon are getting into it over somebody that he wants to cut and she yeah. wants to keep. And he's like, who are you anyways? He says some shit like that to her and she <gasps> starts fucking listing all her accolades and it's fucking awesome awesome you know what i remember that that's i think because it was one or season two it was really it was like all over the place that this happened yeah and everybody and simon just shut the fuck up like (laughs) right because i feel like people don't remember they don't give her her the respect that she actually deserves because she's so behind the scenes on a lot of this stuff yeah yeah Yeah. and she could have even if she never had a pop career i think she could have been iconic just like based on these things alone for sure. But th- she didn't have to do that. But she did. But she did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So th- and those those credits, that's not even everything. But those are just some of my favorites. And like I said, we haven't even covered her pop career. But yeah, Paula is that bitch. Yep. OK, so back in 1987. Straight Paula, up. <laughs> straight up. <laughs> back in 1987, Paula is 25. And she's coming off all the success of her work with Janet. She'd left the Laker girls and she just won her first Emmy for the Tracy Ullman show. 
So she's got some money in her pocket and she uses her savings to make a music demo. Now, as much as I love Janet Jackson, like to me, Janet is like an, she's an all around entertainer. Yeah. Um, I don't think of Janet when I think of great singers, you know? No. But I- Janet is, you know, she's got talent. She's got stage presence. Yes. I was. Gonna- what? <laughs> I was going to say like Britney, but Britney doesn't. <laughs> Britney Janet don't dance well, right? Yeah, yeah. like if Britney could dance, she maybe like J Lo, but I don't like J Lo's music as much, right? At all. So right. yeah, she's like you know a bunch of them put together. <laughs> <laughs> she's like she's a showgirl, like a like a great showgirl, right? You know? Right. So Virgin Records had just recently formed, and one of the executives had just come off working with Janet on her debut for another label, and he was like, "Is Paula a great singer?" you know like yeah you know she can she can say like whatever she could carry a tune but she gave janet all of her swag she's mad talented i think we can sell this and have our own janet jackson of course so she gets signed to virgin records and she releases her debut album forever your girl that's a great Ooh. title the first singles didn't really do much and i think everybody was ready to write it off as a flop but the third single straight up Straight up now, tell me, do you really want to love? Ooh, that song's so good, man. Oh, oh, oh. That was a motherfucking bop. Yeah. And, and she comes out tap dancing and shit. Yes. It's so good. And that was the thing. Like, she had, she had, after working with Janet and the Jacksons and stuff, she already had, like, you know, my videos need to be fucking on point. Like, right. You know, she had she all She knew this. what it took. Yes, exactly. So 64 weeks, 64 weeks after it was released, the album hit number one. Wow. Because <laughs> it's like the first two flopped. It took a yeah. long time. That's awesome though. Damn. So it hit number one and it would go on to be the most successful debut album in history after selling 18 million copies. Holy shit. That's awesome. And you know, like I said, the videos were on point, most notably the video for Opposites Attract. Yes. Which featured Paula dancing with an animated cat named MC Scat Cat. Yeah. <laughs> MC Scat Play. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and that video actually won her her only Grammy to date for, wow. for best music video. Wow. So our girl Paula is just an Oscar and a Tony away from an EGOT. <laughs> That's <laughs> what, fucking crazy. She could do it, honestly. Yeah, she could totally do it. As a choreographer? Tony, yeah, for sure. Oh, but we don't have choreography at, at the Oscars. Oscars? Yeah. That's some fucking bullshit. Yeah. Anyway, so this was also around the time of Paula's first big controversy. She and Virgin Records were sued by a woman named Yvette Marine for millions after she claimed that her vocals were used all over the Forever Your Girl album. Oh. Most notably on Opposites Attract. Paula and the label claimed that her vocals were used only in the background. It actually went to trial, and after two years, a jury sided with Paula and didn't award any damages. To, Ooh, that's a long ass time, to though. Bet, yeah. I kind of like. Ugh. Obviously, you know, like I guess that Paula's not like a, a singer. singer. Yeah. Like, so it, it's kind of like a J Lo situation where they turn her voice way down and they turn the backgrounds way up. So, like, yeah. Ugh, I feel for her. Me too. That sucks. Yvette was saying that's the difference background work on an album and like getting credit for lead vocals like on a track like opposites attract in the 90s that was like a difference of um i don't know getting five grand or a million dollars that's you know? fucking crazy oh anyway so paula ends the 80s on top of the world and crushing it her next album 1991 spellbound is also a massive success and she briefly dated keanu reeves Ooh. Around the time because he appeared in her video for Rush Rush. Rush what? Rush. I gotta look at that video now. It's the one where it's um like Rebel Without a Cause and Keanu's like James Dean. Oh, how cute. Yeah. Paula was feeling her man's Emilio Estevez more than Keanu. Ooh, sorry, Keanu. Nice <laughs> guy's finished last, bro. <laughs> Cause, Emilio! Because <laughs> Emilio and Paula got married in 1992. Oh, damn. <laughs> Their relationship was big in the press. They were definitely an it couple. Yeah. But they ended up getting divorced just two years later in 1994 because Paula wanted kids and Emilio didn't. I'm sorry. I put on this music. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at Keanu. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Emilio wanted kids and she didn't? No, the other way. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
she wanted kids and Emilio didn't, which I feel like is really sad because she doesn't have kids yeah, to that, this day. Oh, that is sad. You know, and he has, he, he didn't want kids because he had kids from a previous relationship. Oh, so it wasn't like he didn't just want kids. Right. He, didn't he want just didn't want any more kids. kids. Yeah, yeah, that's fucked up. So that's really sad. Anyway, I think they still have a pretty good relationship because you only hear them say really nice things about each other. Like they go out of their way to compliment each other. So wow. e- Emilio's with someone though. So Emilio? Yeah. Oh. He's been engaged to her since like 06, I think. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, through the mid to late 90s. Otherwise, I would have been like, I think that they're like a like a Fergie and Prince Andrew situation, like where they, they're they like together and they love each other. And, yeah. But no, he's with somebody. Anyway. Through the mid to late 90s, Paula's career takes a dip after her next album flops and she becomes kind of a has-been, which I think is crazy considering how huge she was. Right. It reminded me, like when you were talking about Gia, yeah it's it's like just a few short years later people would be like who yeah you know like i think paula was sort of in that situation in the late 90s a lot of people were like what yeah that shit's crazy uh she'd sold over 30 million records and had six number ones but all she was doing was hip-hop inspired workout videos and she'd occasionally show up in the tabloids for stuff like going to rehab for her bulimia and no and her brief second marriage to designer brad beckerman oh Whoever that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but she did do one really cool commercial for Diet Coke where through special effects, she gets to dance with a lot of old Hollywood types, including her idol, Gene Kelly. Oh, that's so cute. It is so cute. Oh, yeah. my God. Then came 2001. Never okay. forget. Never forget. And Paula was hired to appear as a judge on a new show called American Idol, which would begin airing the next year. I think that people forget that American Idol was once the biggest show on the planet. Yeah. It was fucking huge. It was huge. They were doing like damn near Super Bowl numbers like every single week. Yeah. It's because they 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 should have ended it like fucking 10 years ago. Yeah. They should have ended it like uh, after who was the last like real like a Jennifer Hudson type. Yes. Okay. So for so they were doing like crazy numbers for most of the early 2000s and paula was beloved and embraced as the nice sometimes wacky judge who served as a foil for the blunt and mean judge simon Kell. so now paula is reintroduced to the world on arguably the biggest stage at the time and she does her best to ride this new career high she appears in commercials she sells shit on qvc she releases a greatest hits record our girl paula is busy she is everywhere and yeah. she's making between five and eight million a year on idol wow that's yeah. awesome good for her yeah she actually years later when she leaves she wanted um she wanted 20 million and they said yeah. no but nt was talking about the voice uh-huh. and how i think adam levine they had offered him somewhere like 15 million uh-huh and th- that's the money that he turned down right now when he refused to renew his contract but he was making somewhere he was making somewhere in this paula area like five to eight million and and he was like that's actually not that much considering like how much work goes into it like you know you're you're like working full time you're working full time on this yeah but yeah so she was making that money but well deserved you know right anyway so she's getting a lot of attention and with that increased scrutiny right in late 2004 paula hit a car pretty badly when she was driving and just took the fuck off. <laughs> but the thing <laughs> is, <laughs> by 2004, people had cell phones with cameras. Yes. Even if they were just flip phones or whatever. Because the woman that she hit snapped a pic of Paula's license plate. <laughs> oh, Paula man. got caught. She had to plead no contest to the misdemeanor hit and run charge and got 24 months probation and a $1,700 fine. Oh, damn. Oh, that's hella messy, girl. <laughs> That's, I think like this is when you start to see the cracks showing yeah, up on, yeah, on yeah, Paula. Yeah, yeah. Just a few months later, in May 2005, Corey Clark, a former contestant on the second season of American Idol, <laughs> who'd been dramatically kicked off the show for not disclosing his criminal history, alleged that Paula coached him while he was on the show Ooh. and that they had a three month long sexual relationship. Ooh, salacious. <laughs> Clark wrote a book detailing his allegations against Paula called, quote, They told me not to tell the truth, comma, so, ellipses, colon, 
the sex, comma, lies, and politics, as in Paula. Oh, my of, gosh. <laughs> of one of America's idols. Jesus. <laughs> Could he, he might as well have just been like the time I fucked Paula. <laughs> you know, like, oh, my God. What is a title? That's that ridiculous. Is my favorite thing. Politics. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so he released that book along with his self-titled debut album, Corey Clark. Oh, my gosh. And that he shit was not a bop. It was not, and no, it actually had production on it by like the Black Eyed Peas. Oh wow! That but sucks. It, it didn't go anywhere. Wow. So he, Corey claims that Paula told him how to dress, how to do his hair, what songs to sing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wow. As proof, Corey provided phone records showing hours upon hours of late night phone calls, a fairly benign voicemail, and a bottle of prescription cough syrup. Alleged, what? allegedly prescribed to Paula, which he had for oh, some reason. So, so the were, implication being like, you know, they were casually. You have, you have to have some level of intimacy with someone to have like their prescriptions, you know? Well, that's true. So Paula responded to the allegations by saying that she, quote, would not dignify his claims with a response. Oh. And, <laughs> and quote, not only do I never lie, I never respond to lies. Mm. <laughs> which is, that? I mean, that's hilarious because... That's yeah. a response. Yes. <laughs> Fox and the producers of Idol hire a third party to investigate the claims, which, of course, find no wrongdoing on Paula's part. And the scandal eventually went away. Although I'm curious about how it would be handled in the Me Too era. Yeah, that's true, actually. This would be a really interesting case because it's, yes. you know, the other way. Yeah, yeah that's it. that is true. And there's no, it's not like um, she didn't rape anyone, but it's right. like power dynamics. Of and- course. I think this would be uh, up there with, it, it would be murky, sort of like the Aziz Ansari thing. Oh, yeah. So it would mm-hmm. be something like that. But Yeah, we kind of don't know how to feel about it. Right. Just a, just an interesting thought exercise. Right. Also, also, Corey Clark has had several run-ins with the law having to do with violence against women. Oh. So, so, I don't know if So, he's he re- no fucking... I don't know if he respects women enough to tell the truth or, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. By 2007, Paula has been on Idol for a few years and then decides to star in her own reality show, Hey Paula, Ooh. but bravo. This would ultimately prove to be a big mistake. Uh-oh. She acts fucking crazy on the show. Uh-oh. But she does say one of the all-time great lines ever said on reality TV, which was when she was caught on a hot mic saying that she was, quote, tired of people not treating me like the gift that I am. Oh shit! <laughs> Yo, this. Ooh, I wish. Ooh, I wish that would have been like my my senior quote. Yeah, <laughs> in the yearbook. <laughs> that shit is good. That's amazing. Paula criticized the way the show was edited and declined to do a second season, but the show was canceled after seven episodes anyway due to low ratings. Oh, that sucks. Although I actually kind of want to watch it because the YouTube videos are insane. Like the few clips that I've seen, it looks actually really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like a, it's like a crazier Real Housewives. Mm. Also, it reminds me a lot of what might be in my top five favorite shows. Uh, HBO's The Comeback with Lisa Kudrow. Oh, yes. <laughs> because it's just she's Paula is doing the most. Oh, so. yeah. So if you've never seen The Comeback, I suggest you watch it. Especially in the context of like early reality TV, early like 2000s reality TV. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, So anyway, she explained about the show, quote, that was hard for me to watch. Disturbing. They put a camera on me when I got wind that my dog was in a coma and they'd make it seem like I was crying about hair and makeup. Oh, so that's quite the, uh, the allegation there. Yeah, but remember when we talked to Katie, she did say that she thought that editing could make or break a villain. Yeah, that's what I was going to tell you. I was going to bring up Katie. Cause, yeah, because yeah. I always am like, it's you guys are full of shit. Like, that's what you really like. But then Katie made me. But I back. could I could see them, I don't know, using selective editing, not in this way to like make a whole new like, you know, like pretty much pull a story out of their ass. Like, right. I'm, I could see it more just like playing up like your worst qualities. Right. Or playing down your best qualities. This seems like they just made like some shit up. Made some shit up, yeah. On the show, Paula is often seemingly intoxicated. 
Although later in 2001, she told Julie Chen Moonbez that <laughs> she's <laughs> that she's never been physically drunk in her life. Oh, <laughs> just mentally, <laughs> just emotionally. <laughs> oh. I've been all three in like the last five 24 days. hours. <laughs> but if uh, if you want to have a little fun, look up Paula Abdul drunk on YouTube. Oh, there are several compilations of her on her show on the news promoting American Idol on QVC selling shit on American Idol itself. Her behavior was kind of low key concerning for a point. Paula denies, denies, denies that she has any problems with drugs or alcohol. But a few years later, she admits that she does have a physical dependence on painkillers. Oh, wow. Ultimately wearing a patch during the American Idol years that administered an opioid dose 80 times that of morphine. Holy shit. She says she needed it following a chronic pain diagnosis after dance injuries, car accidents, and a plane crash. What? Okay, the plane crash. This is a story that came to my attention last week from Jezebel, which is why I wanted to do Paula in the first place. Uh huh. Since at least 2003, Paula has been claiming that she survived a plane crash for which no records exist. Oh my God. She says that she was getting from one date to another during her Under My Spell tour, which ran from 91 to 92. She claims that it was a seven-seater plane, one of the engines blew up, a wing caught fire, and the plane crash-landed in Iowa. She says that she was unconscious, pulled from the plane, had to have 15 cervical spinal surgeries, and that that's why she seemingly disappeared for seven years in the mid to late 90s. And there's no record of this. Nothing. Oh, my God. Paula, Liter- please. Literally not a single record. No hospital record. No records with the National Transportation Safety Board. And Come on. They would absolutely, they, that, that's their fucking job, to keep track of every single plane crash, investigate and like, find out what happened to save other people. No, they have no record of anything like this ever happening. Wow. No newspaper reports from the time. And if you think about it, this was like when Paula Abdul was one of the biggest stars. This is she's up there with Madonna and um, and Janet and Whitney at this time. She's like 91, 92, one of the hottest stars. You yeah. would think that she's in a plane crash. You would see something. Of but course. no, nothing. Just the first time she mentioned it on Dateline in 2003. A couple of radio interviews since then and her appearance a couple weeks ago on RuPaul's new talk show, which is why this is up. Plus, her timeline of events of when it supposedly happened is very strange because she was in the middle of a tour going from one stop to another, and we know that she didn't cancel any shows. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> she claims that it happened on her birthday, which during that tour was on a day before a show in, in Denver and a day after a show in St. Louis, and she played both shows. Yeah, because she wasn't in a fucking plane <laughs> crash, that's why. Like, you know, really 15 spinal surgeries and you didn't take a single night off. It's always scary to me when people reach this level of lying. Yeah. Because it's For what? Like, yeah. And why like stick to the lie? Like it's so we all know it's fake. Right. So why stick to the lie then too? That's also fucking scary. It's yeah. I think she's reaching, you know, she has a drug problem. Right. And, and she's reaching for ways to explain Justify. it away. Yeah. yeah. Plus, the other thing that's weird is that she claims it happened in 93. And you would think you you almost died. You had this near-death experience. You would remember what year it happened. Mm -hmm. She claims it happened in 93, but that tour was between 1991 and 1992. Okay. Also, she didn't really go away for seven years after the Under My Spell tour. She released and did shows for a whole ass other album, the one that flopped. And she did those workout videos those hip-hop work workout videos oh, yeah. so like it's just not it doesn't add up in oh but then at the in the comments of the story in jezebel someone wrote that their homie used to work at the starbucks in i think it was like in brentwood by her house mm-hmm. and says that paula would call in at least once a week and try to order chinese food from them oh shit <laughs> <laughs> so so uh yeah she's doing stuff yeah she faded (laughs) uh in april of 06 paula filed a police report claiming that she'd sustained a concussion and spinal injuries at a party where she argued with a random guy and he threw her against a wall oh no don't do i've been there girl don't be arguing (laughs) with random guys (laughs) there's literally no other info on this aside from the police report so wow um 
In November 2008, a 30-year-old woman named Paula Goodspeed killed herself in her car outside of Paula's house. Oh, no. She was found surrounded by prescription pills, photos, and CDs of Paula. Oh, no. She legally changed her name to Paula, sent our Paula flowers, and auditioned for American Idol a few years before. Oh, man, that's scary. Her family claims she is not a stalker. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, so... I think she, she, she technically didn't, like, stalk her. Right. She, just, she like, was obsessed. just, like, obsessed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Paula left Idol in 09, did a stint in rehab for the painkillers, and has kept busy judging other competition shows, including The X Factor and So You Think You Can Dance. Mm -hmm. She's perfect on So You Think You Can Dance. I don't know why she... Yeah, wasn't there to begin with. Yeah. In 2000... And she's not on it anymore. Like, she quit. Mm, okay. I think... Uh, I don't want to speculate, but she has a problem keeping almost any job, but... Mm -hmm. yeah, except for American Idol. Mm -hmm. So Anyway. Uh, in 2012, she and her insurance company had to pay out a million dollar settlement to a woman who fell in her driveway. Wow. In 2014, she sued a company called UVA Sun West after claiming she received second and third degree burns from a tanning treatment and was seeking damages in excess of $25,000. Wow. That doesn't sound like enough. But anyway, I think they might have just paid her because that shit just went away. She just announced a Vegas residency called Paula Abdul Forever Your Girl. Okay. At the Flamingo, which starts in August and goes through next year. The Flamingo? Mm-hmm. At oh. the Donnie and Marie Theater. Oh, <laughs> no, girl. That's also where Tony Braxton and Babyface did their little residency, okay, okay. too. Uh, anyway, and that puts us up to date with the iconic Paula Abdul forever, our girl. Nice. Great job, May. Thanks. The best part oh, of this God. is that I got to listen to Janet Jackson <laughs> set. <laughs> Gotta watch the videos. I yeah, think. for sure. Dude, Janet has. We gotta do Janet. Yeah, she got like, but she she's like so Quiet. rich and famous. Yeah. yeah, all her scandals are real secret. Yeah, and all her shit. Yeah, her shit doesn't come out until like years later. Yeah, so who knows what's going on right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was our episode. Thanks for listening. Hit us up on Instagram and Twitter, as always, at Drama Club Pod, on the website, dramaclubpod.com, and on the Gmail, dramaclubpod at gmail.com. On the hotline, 505-539-0556, at our P.O. Box, P.O. Box number 27433-LACA90027, and leave us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye. Bye. However, whatever with your helmet. <laughs>